Welcome everybody to our weekly webinar series for the Healy ALS platform trial. I'm Merit Sukovich. I'm here with a lot of people that we'll introduce. Um, and today is one of our uh, webinars where we've uh, invited one of our partners uh, from industry to come and tell you about the exciting science behind their drug um, uh, uh, that led us to, to choose them to be one of the initial uh, partners in the Healy ALS platform trial. So before we launch into that, uh, just for uh, some of you who might uh, have this as your first uh, webinar you've come, I want to just give a, a little um, update about the platform trial, and then I'll pass uh, pass to the leaders of the clean regimen. Uh, next slide, please. So the traditional trial uh, typically tested one drug at a time, and it would take a little time to um, write the protocol, get all the sites ready, and enroll participants, get results. And at the end, you'd know the results of one drug. And the analogy is, is like, you wouldn't play a soccer, a football game by building the, the stadium every time and then taking it down at the end. And instead, we wanted to use an approach uh, that's been uh, tried and proven quite successful uh, in oncology, where we designed something called a platform trial. And here, the analogy is, again, like build a stadium once and keep playing in it or, or keep doing what you want to do in there until you have um, your results. And the results for us would be having effective treatments. And what you do here is you test multiple uh, treatments uh, in people with ALS and you have, you share the infrastructure, you share the, the data from the people on placebo. And at the end of um, the given regimen, you might have answers to three or four drugs and you keep adding drugs until you find um, the effective treatments. And you can also adapt along the way. If you find something that's positive, you can add that to all the other regimens. Um, and it's much more flexible and it saves an enormous amount of time. It cuts the time in about in half to find effective treatments. It cuts the cost of finding um, new treatments by about a third. And it greatly increases um, the number of people who are on active medication uh, during the trial. Next slide. So we're very excited to launch the first platform trial in ALS and also um, uh, to really set the stage of how trials are done in ALS throughout the world, as well as in other neurological illnesses. Um, so this is the design of the Healy ALS platform trial. Um, participants come in, uh, they are randomized to one of the available treatments. And right now we have four treatments in the platform trial. You will know which treatment you're assigned to. Here we just call them um, A, B, C, and D. And then there's another randomization where people are randomized to get the active treatment. Um, so to actually get the investigational product or placebo and it's three to one. So 75% of people get active drug, 25% placebo for the 24 weeks of what we call the blinded period. After that 24 weeks, um, everybody, if they want, can choose to go into what we call open label extension. And that's where uh, everybody does get the investigational product. So if, for example, you were in the 75%, let's say in, in regimen A, the Luca plan, uh, for the 24 weeks, then you could go into open label extension and continue to get the active treatment. If you were in the placebo for those 24 weeks, you can choose to go to the open label extension and get the, um, the active product uh, during that time. And we keep the open label extension going really until we have the results of the double line period. And then based on the results, you know, there would be decision whether to keep going on that or not. So that's our design. And we really made it as a requirement for all our partners to offer that open label extension. Um, the four drugs that are, are in the platform are Zalucaplan, Verdipistat, CNM AO, AU8, and Predopidine. Last, uh, two weeks ago, we had a webinar with our colleagues from Philenia on Predopidine. Um, if you missed that, we did a record it, and that's on our Healy website. Um, and today we're going to hear from our partners at Clean Nanomedicine on CNM AU8 or Regimen C. And we're also recording uh, this webinar, and we'll post that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So for every regimen, we have uh, uh, leaders of the, of the trial, academic leaders. And for, for this, uh, for the clean uh, regimen, the leaders are Dr. James Berry from uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston and Dr. Nicholas Maragakis from John Hopkins uh, University at Baltimore. And they're on the line here today to answer your questions in the Q&A. And with that, um, I'll pass um, the floor to our colleagues from Clean Nanomedicine uh, we have Robert, Dr. Robert Gats, uh, Glansman here with us and uh, Michael Hodgkin, and they have uh, recorded their science presentation, but they are here uh, live to answer questions after their recording.
So this is our first recording, so hopefully it'll go Hello. well. My name is Dr. Robert Glassman, Chief Medical Officer of Clean Nanomedicine. On behalf of Clean, it is my pleasure to speak with you today. Today I'll be discussing CNMA-08, which is the uh, therapy being tested in Regimen C of the Healy ALS platform trial. I'll discuss what CNMA-08 is, briefly uh, a little bit about how it works, and then some of the supporting evidence uh, to support the um, use of CNMA-8 uh, in the treatment of patients with uh, ALS. So uh, gold is a very interesting atom. Uh, it has a free electron in its uh, outer orbital shell. And uh, although we know that gold is quite inert um, and does not oxidize, which is one reason why it's been used for centuries for jewelry, uh, at the nanoscale, uh, uh, with clean surfaced uh, crystals of gold, they can be quite catalytically uh, active. And the breakthrough of clean is that we are able to manufacture clean surfaced uh, crystals of transition metals at the nanoscale and keep them stable in suspension uh, in pharmaceutical grade water without any other excipients. And what this allows for is these crystals to have direct biological effects. And as we will see uh, in the case of gold, uh, it can act as a catalyst uh, to support bioenergetic reactions uh, within cells, and most particularly uh, neurons and uh, glia, which are highly uh, energetically dependent. So what is a nanocatalyst? Well, nano means very, very small. And in fact, um, in the case of CNMA-8, these uh, pure, clean-surfaced gold crystals 10,000 of them would fit across uh, one of your hairs. So they're quite small. They're able to be, get into cells and actually get uh, into mitochondria. Uh, they are so tiny. And the term catalyst refers to uh, a substance which uh, lowers the energy of activation of a, of a biochemical reaction uh, or any, any uh, chemical reaction. Uh, and uh, in this case, these crystals act physiochemically by directly donating and or receiving electrons uh, within the cell, within biological systems, and especially uh, within um, mitochondrial uh, reactions. And on the lower right, you can see a graphic comparing CNMAUA to other gold nanocrystals, which are made uh, by standard manufacturing practices, uh, in terms of catalyzing the reaction of nicotine adenine dinucleotide hydride, or NADH, uh, to nicotine adenine dinucleotide, or NAD. And this turns out to be a very important reaction in terms of driving uh, bioenergetic support within cells and generating something called ATP, uh, which is the monetary exchange of energy within cells. And ATP is what mitochondria produce, uh, in order, um, among other things, in order to uh, support the energy needs of cells. So we know that bioenergetic failure is an important uh, component of many neurodegenerative diseases, uh, including ALS. All of us are born with uh, our own genetic predispositions to disease, but in general, uh, these neurodegenerative diseases come on uh, with aging. And that is because as we age, we all lose bioenergetic capacity, uh, especially within neurons and glia, they're supporting cells. Um, and that's just uh, normal. We lose mitochondria, the mitochondria we have are less efficient. And in terms of ALS, we know that there are several genetically defined mechanisms uh, which can actually cause motor neurons to, to die, to demyelinate. And those involve uh, stresses to the cell, uh, something called we call excitotoxic stress, and uh, stress from uh, toxic chemicals we call reactive oxygen species as well as the aggregation of these abnormal protein aggregates, which really don't belong within the cell uh, cytoplasm, but uh, aggregate there. And on the left, you can see a graphic of an astrocyte, a toxic astrocyte, uh, you know, harming a neuron and uh, causing demyelination. Uh, in the center, uh, you can see a graphic of what CNMA-8 does. Again, these gold nanocrystals, because they're clean surfaced and highly faceted, are able to directly donate or receive electrons uh, within the cell, within uh, the chemical reactions of the cell, which drive uh, ATP formation, which is the monetary exchange of energy within cells. 
Uh, these gold nanocrystals are also uh, able to directly donate electrons and reduce reactive oxygen species, which are some of the harmful chemicals uh, that can cause damage to cells. Uh, and through um, a, a pathway called the heat shock one protein pathway, these crystals are able to reduce uh, toxic aggregates of proteins, which also causes damage within cells of patients with ALS. So on the right, you can see uh, a healthy uh, uh, neuron with healthy uh, myelin uh, and a, a healthy astrocyte, um, you know, following uh, exposure to CNMA weight. And on slide six, we can see the results of an experiment performed at Johns Hopkins University, where human and motor neurons were uh, co-cultured, that is grown with uh, astrocytes uh, taken from ALS patients. And you can see looking from left to right uh, that either no treatment, uh, treatment with an inactive substance called vehicle, or even treatment with realizol, uh, one of the approved drugs for uh, ALS, resulted in marked uh, neuronal loss that is death of the neurons as well as loss of the neurochemical that neurons used to uh, speak to each other called uh, acetylcholine, uh, as well as loss of the axons, the dendritic processes and axons that uh, uh, neurons used to speak with each other. But as you can see in the right three, uh, right three columns, increasing doses of CNMA-8 uh, provide really a remarkable uh, neuronal preservation along with, and these neurons are functional, they're making acetylcholine uh, and they are uh, continuing to make and extend uh, axons and other dendritic processes so that they can uh, speak with other uh, neurons and, uh, and transmit information to the muscles, um, which is what uh, motor neurons normally do. And on slide seven, we can see the results of a transgenic mouse model where seen amenuate extended the median lifespan, that is the lifespan of at least half of the animals uh, by 20%. Uh, here on slide eight is just to highlight that uh, a very extensive preclinical toxicology program was performed, uh, and there were no adverse events seen with CNMA-8 in, in animals, despite being given uh, massive doses. And on slide nine is just to um, highlight the fact that uh, we have not seen serious adverse events uh, with CNMA-8 in, in human beings. Uh, we currently have approximately 70 patient years of experience. Uh, and growing, and so far the uh, adverse event profile of CNMA has been uh, really uh, quite acceptable. So with that, I'd like to thank you on behalf of CLEAN and let you know that uh, your participation really means the world to us. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I think we now are open up uh, the webinar for uh, Q&A. So if, uh, if people have questions for Robert or for James or uh, Nick, uh, please type them in the Q&A. Uh, James or Nick, if you wanna put your videos on. Yes. Sure. We while, while we're waiting maybe for some questions, Nick, I know a lot of the science uh, was done in Hopkins in your lab. I love you maybe to talk about a little bit about the mechanism of action and your, your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I hope you can hear me. I think it's really, um, you know, as both a clinician and a, and a basic scientist, we, we look for a few things. What excited me about this compound as a clinician was that it, it's, it seems to be really well tolerated and and Robert alluded to that in his presentation, um, it seems to be easy to take. Um, and so that's also really attractive. From the standpoint of you know, mechanism of action, what's really unique is that this isn't a traditional drug as we think about drugs, but in fact, it is, is it um, a unique compound that probably has several mechanisms of action. And, and, and Robert outlined some of those. And so you know, we talk a lot in ALS about is there one pathway that's relevant or are there potentially multiple pathways that could be relevant to neuroprotection? And uh, so I, I think in some ways, this compound may be acting in, in, in several, several different mechanisms, whether that's through you know, bioenergetics or reduction of reactive oxygen species, um, or maybe other mechanisms as far as improving um, you know, enzymatic function, I think are what make, the, what make the compound, I think, really exciting. So we haven't nailed down one specific ALS relevant pathway, but that might be a good thing, particularly for patients with sporadic disease where there may not be one cause of ALS. And so I, I think that's what we found attractive. And, you know, 
we did this in our laboratory, you know, very rigorously and, and our, our data actually using human motor neurons, not in a, in a mouse model or not in using other neuron types, but in human um, IPS motor neurons was actually really encouraging. So that's, that's what I would say. We're still trying to see whether there's one specific mechanism or whether this might be, you know, um, good for several, uh, targeting several different pathways. Uh, thank you. Um, James, I was wondering if you might just share what the doses are in the trial. Yeah, so, so um, the trial is, um, unlike some of the other, um, the, the other uh, regimens in, in the platform trial, we have um, two different doses. And the reasoning behind that is that um, you know, two, two doses, exploring two doses gives us more information potentially about a dose response. So if we see some response at a lower dose and, a, and more response at a higher dose, then we can say, oh, there's, you know, there is a, there's a, 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 what we call a dose response. Um, and in this case, we thought that, that, that it, was, it was worth looking for that. At the same time, the hypothesis is that probably the lower dose is, uh, is effective. And so we may actually just see an effect that's the same in both doses, and that would be fine. And, 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 in, and the analysis plan allows us to pool those as one uh, sort of one treatment arm. So the, the lower dose is 30, the higher dose is 60. Um, and, and we, um, you know, I think, I think we're in some ways getting the best of both worlds by, by testing both of those doses. Great, thank you. Um, Robert, there's a couple of questions for you on the, what you presented. And uh, one of them was, what's your, what's the expected time frame before a patient might see some results? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so here's what we know. We know that in human beings, steady state in the blood is reached within about two to three weeks. Now, nobody's donated their body to science yet, so we don't really know about tissue steady state, but we do know in animals, tissue steady state is reached in about three months. And the other thing we do know, just in terms of reassurance, is that if you stop CNMA weight, these crystals are excreted from the body, so they will go away. They don't stay in your body forever. Um, now, as far as how long it takes to be effective, um, we have, we don't have any data, specific data comparing CNMA weight to placebo yet. We're doing several clinical trials, placebo controlled clinical trials. None of them have been blinded yet. So what we have is blinded data that we can look at for the entire population. And we have one uh, phase two study ongoing in MS, another phase two study ongoing in ALS. And of course, we're participating in the Healy trial. And what we've seen, at least in our blinded data set is that there seem to be improvements in both MS patients and ALS patients in, in the whole population. And those improvements seem to begin at week 12, which is the first time we actually are looking. But um, they seem to continue through week 24 and week 36. Now, we don't know if that's just due to placebo effect or what, uh, but um, it, there's, the evidence that we have suggests that the onset of effect begins at week 12 and continues for as long as we've been actually looking. Thank you. There's another question about one of the charts that you showed. It, um, it showed the in increased concentration of CNMAU8. Um, as it increased, the cells look better. Um, and they kind of want to know, uh, compared to those concentrations, where, where does the Healy trial concentration fit in? Yeah, that's a good question too. And I would also uh, ask Nicholas to uh, comment on this since he did the experiment. Um, but um, what we do know is that at least in blood, the, the, what we're giving orally to human beings, because their guts are so much bigger and so much longer than animals, they absorb more than CMMA weight than animals do. And so we do know that at least in blood, the exposures that we reach with the doses that we're giving human beings, at, especially at 30 milligrams and really at 60 milligrams, even more so, uh, is equivalent to that uh, kind of exposure that has been used in experiments, you know, to establish the mechanism of action of CMMA weight. And Nicholas may want to comment on the on the kind of exposures that he used in the experiments? I think the thing that um, I guess I would say pleased us the most was that we saw a relative dose dependent um, effect on neuroprotection. You know, in a, um, in a dish, it's, it's very hard to correlate those directly with what one might expect to see when we give it in, a, in, a, in, in, in the body. That goes with absorption and how, you know, how that gets into different tissues. So I don't think we can make a, uh, let's say a one-to-one -one correlation, but I, I think was encouraging and pleasing was that we saw a dose-dependent effect. 
And thank you. And if I could just comment on the dose, it's the two doses it's themselves. We were only planning on taking one dose into the study, a 30 milligram dose. It was actually the neuro division of the FDA that suggested that we actually do dose ranging and then we actually add a higher dose. And I think that a lot of that was based on the fact that, you know, we had done a very extensive preclinical toxicology program at their, you know, in cooperation with them. And they were very comfortable with giving higher doses of CNMAU8 from a safety perspective. And I think that's why they encouraged us to, uh, to try an additional higher dose. And that's why we did that. Thank you. Um, James, this is a general question, I think, about the platform trial, which is, um, is there an expected outcome in terms of um, improvement of speech, uh, lung function, or motor function in general? What was the trial designed to pick up? Yeah, so it's a great question. So the, the, the trial in general is designed to pick up um, something like a 30% slowing. We primarily looked at the ALS functional rating scale as um, the outcome measure. The statistic be behind it are a little more complicated than that, but, but that's, that's essentially where it lands. Um, we have probably not quite as much power to, to statistically prove differences for some of the secondary endpoints. And by secondary endpoints, I just mean the other outcomes that we're looking at that we didn't, we didn't sort of um, heavily in the planning. So for example, um, we have a motor speech outcome. We know a little bit less about motor speech analysis. We know that it, it does change quantifiably with disease. It's possible that it will actually be a more powerful endpoint and we'll be able to sort of have more likelihood of showing statistical change with that outcome than with the ALS functional rating scale, for example. Generally for breathing outcomes, there's more variability um, in, in those outcomes than there is in the ALS functional rating scale, not only because of the way we measure it, but also because some people have breathing that's affected earlier in the disease and, and others not until it's later in the disease. Um, and so, um, we, we certainly will be able to detect a change. We may have a little bit less what we call statistical power to see that. Um, hopefully that answers it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a, a couple questions maybe for Nick and, and Robert here. So back to that same comparison table, why did it seem that Rilzo had a worse effect uh, even uh, compared to no treatment? I guess the first question, is that true? Did you see that? And then if, if yes, what uh, in the explanation? So what, one of the rationales behind looking at really is always to see in our particular paradigm, which is really kind of is highly contrived. So, you know, we, we cultured ALS astrocytes and, 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 and motor neurons. And so unlike the body where you have several different types of, of, of cells, and I spoke to the differences in absorption and drug delivery, this is a, um, allows us to look at very specific pathways. And so I, I think it may be a couple things. Um, one is that Riluzol may not act directly on this astrocyte-mediated toxicity that we were actually studying, and, and I think that's the more I think that's the most likely um, um, uh, explanation for that. We wanted to include Riluzol because it's considered such a standard of uh, such a standard of care. So if we had used another drug like Radicava, maybe we would have seen um, differences. But that was the rationale behind in including the Riluzol. Um, in that, just to compare what we have currently and can we do better? You know, interestingly to the, to the question, you know, really is all in a lot of different models, both in tissue culture and even in mouse models has not been shown to be that effective, um, yet it clearly does have efficacy in patients. And so um, it's part of what we think about it when we translate a drug, how do you start from a dish and, and, get, and get to a patient? Yeah, maybe a follow-up question for this, uh, um, because I, I know Robert showed the mouse data too. Um, I just, I didn't want people to feel like that wasn't a big effect. So I didn't know if, if you wanted to explain, uh, you know, how that mouse is made and, and what does it mean if, it, if the median survival is prolonged? Yeah, the, um, the SOD1 mouse model has really been the, the primary um, way of studying ALS um, prior to getting to patients, essentially, for all the reasons that Robert um, and James were saying, you know, it, it allows us to look at, to deliver a drug, it allows us to look at absorption of a drug, and, and as best we can model, um, it allows us to see what we might expect in patients. Um, the, the challenge of that model is that it, it really only, it may only represent a small proportion of ALS patients, and that is 
that that model of ALS really only um, is representative of a small number of, of ALS patients, maybe that 1% who carry the SOD1 mutation. So I want to emphasize that it doesn't mean it can't represent ALS as a whole. Um, and it's number and number two is it's the best model we have. We don't have a model of sporadic ALS that, that's very reliable that might help us to predict more. So we take it with a grain of salt. Nevertheless, these mouse models or this particular mouse model does recapitulate many of the things we see in our ALS patients. In fact, these mice lose motor neurons, they become progressively weak, and then they have respiratory uh, failure. Um, and so in many ways does model what we expect to see um, in ALS. So the fact that we saw a shifting of that or a prolonging of survival with this drug compound, I think leads us to believe that, um, gives us one more piece, one more piece of the puzzle to suggest in ALS patients, maybe that is really relevant. And so you know, when we bring a drug to ALS patients, we try to put all these puzzle pieces together. Does it work in a dish? Does it, is it well tolerated? Does it work in a mouse model? Um, does it work in human IPS cells? And we put these pieces together, hopefully to, to build a, um, a portfolio to see how might, allows us to predict how it might, might work in ALS patients. Thank you. Um, uh, Robert, there was a question about um, your last slide where, um, where you showed the trials. It says, is it being tested in three different trials? Uh, yes, so uh, we, we are, you know, of course, part of the Healy platform trial, which we're very grateful to be a part of. Um, and we're also uh, in a phase two uh, ALS study in Australia called Resco ALS, which is fully enrolled. Uh, and we expect to have primary data out um, sometime uh, late in the summer, uh, maybe, or, or September uh, Q3. And then we also have a phase two ongoing study in MS, patients with multiple sclerosis called Visionary MS. Um, and then we have a couple of studies being performed at UG Southwestern looking at target engagement with something called phosphorus P31 MR spectroscopy. Uh, and those are, that, that's being done in patients with Parkinson's disease and patients with MS. Great, thank you. Um, also for you, Robert, have you determined any side effects? Yeah, that's a great question. So we haven't seen any serious adverse events, but we do tend to see some things, um, especially at the higher doses. We can see some diarrhea or gastric upset. Uh, we can see some um, headache. We've actually seen some vivid dreaming. Um, so these are the type, and we've seen, I think in one case, uh, some a little uh, rash on the lips. Um, uh, so those are the kinds of things that we've seen, but none of them have been even moderately severe. They've all been, they've all been mild, so. Great, thank you. Uh, James, there's some more questions about dose. Um, so maybe you could answer them. One is, is about the dose in the open label. And the other is um, about how the doses are given. Is it first the 30, then the 60, or different doses for different people? Yeah, so different doses are given to different people. <clears throat> um, so people are randomized to either placebo, low dose, or high dose. And again, um, just to, I, I want to stress that, that the original plan was really to do low dose for everyone. And what is what became the low dose for everyone, and there was an opportunity to look at a higher dose. The expectation is that the low dose is 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 enough to be effective, and so we we may not. It may be sort of a moot point. Um, it does appear that you know it doesn't seem like there's a um, a clear safety signal like the higher doses is, is has any safety issues at all. Um, it, we may see a better efficacy. We might not. It might it might look the same. Um, so, so I don't, you know, I, I, I want to be clear that, that people are on drug at a dose that we think is effective, even if they're on the quote unquote low dose, that's really important. Um, and then um, when people come to the end of the trial, um, they either remain on their dose or if they're on placebo, go on to one of the, one of the other doses. Um, and, and that, you know, again, we don't know which of these doses is, is, uh, is going to be most effective, but our guess is that we get effect at the lowest dose, and that we we probably should would be would be uh, doing everybody a favor by calling that, um, you know, normal dose, um, because that's the one that we that we initially set out to test. Yeah, yeah, Jay, if I could just comment on that. The thirty milligram dose, which is the quote low dose in this study, is the highest dose we're using in any other study, including the phase two ALS trial that we're doing in Australia. That's 
30, 30 milligram dose is the highest dose we're using everywhere else. The only reason we um, added the 60 milligram arm or the, you know, th that dose was because of FDA's request. Yeah, and that is a, uh, not an unusual FDA request. They like for companies and uh, investigators to explore multiple doses because they, they want to know what the range is, and the optimal dose. Right. Um, so the, this question, um, I think anyone could try to answer. It's what, are there any impacts for someone with ALS who might have gotten mesenchymal stem cells and then started a trial uh, like CNM AU8? Would this impact nerve growth? Um. I can come a little, we don't know. I mean, we, we have not done any animal work, animal toxicology work where we, um, you know, injected mesenchymal stem cells and then, you know, given CNMA weight. So the answer is we don't know. We hope not, but we simply don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Could I just amplify on that? I just, just very, very briefly, you know, um, the, the mesenchymal stromal cells are, um, the, the thought is that their, their effect is transient. And so the, the, the absolute answer is we don't know, um, but um, this is different than cells that we would put in and expect that they would um, you know, live there indefinitely and, and may still be um, alive and exerting an effect by the time people go into the trial. That's true, thank you. So there's a couple of questions about expanded access and I'm gonna, Robert, if you wanna answer first and I can uh, augment. Uh, one is when someone who's um, six years into having ALS and, and wouldn't be eligible for the ALS platform trial, is there an option to receive um, CNM AU8 on a compassionate use basis? And uh, a related question, will this drug be part of an expanded access? Sorry, I was having a hard time getting off mute. Um, so um, yes, we do have expanded access programs ongoing and they're all actually being run through Massachusetts General Hospital. So um, Merritt knows them very well. There's one that's actually at MGH itself. And there's another one that's actually being, and Merritt, you, you can describe this better than I can. It's actually being kind of implemented through some of the Healy sites uh, themselves. Uh, let me just say that on, on behalf of CLEAN, we want to um, allow access to CNMA way to everybody um, who um, is in, in need or wants to uh, be exposed to it. Um, you know, of course, FDA has issues with exposing too many people to a drug that's not been proven to be safe or effective. So there's, there are limitations uh, from FDA, but we have significant manufacturing limitations. Um, CNMA 8 is not manufactured by any um, process that's ever been undertaken before. Uh, we're using plasma physics uh, it, it's, uh, and the concentration of the product that's initially made into a um, concentration that is um, being used uh, in clinical trials is very, very difficult. So, um, you know, we're a small company. We're actually less than hundred people in total. Um, and we uh, have plans to expand our manufacturing capacity, but it's very expensive and, and it takes a long time to build these manufacturing facilities. So um, unfortunately we're, we're, we're really quite limited in how many people we can uh, support in an expanded access program. So uh, Clean was very generous to allow us to start a um, expanded access program at MassGeral maybe uh, more than a year ago now. It was one of our first ones. And uh, so we, we do have about 30 people in there and they've now uh, also uh, been generous to allow us to add some more sites um, in, the, in the Healy platform trial who could do a, a small expanded access. So we are working on, on that um, second approach. So I do thank you for that. And I, acknowledging the challenges of drug manufacturing. Um, so there's a question, if I start uh, the trial, will I be able to begin CNMAU8 at the 24 week uh, point? Now, James, if you wanna answer that. I'm, I'm sorry, say, say, ask the question one more time. Oh, if I start uh, the trial, will I be able to begin CNMAU8 at the 24 week point, the open label extension? I'm not sure I'm understanding. So, so if, you, if you enter the trial, yeah. And, and maybe randomize the placebo or, or maybe to the study drug. When you get to the open label extension, you will have the opportunity to, um, to, to continue on and in open label, everybody will be receiving drug, yes. Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, um, okay, good. By improvement, do you mean slowing of progression or actual um, nerve function? 
know, Robert, you wanna take that one? Well, in animals, you know, um, well, let me put it this way. Uh, what we saw in the mouse model that James, uh, that Nicholas Maragakis described, Dr. Maragakis, what we saw was slowing of, 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 of uh, worsening. Um, and so, you know, the study, and James can describe this better than I can, it is designed to uh, demonstrate slowing of, of progression. Uh, that being said, um, we do have some evidence in humans from our phase two uh, clinical trial in Australia that there may be some at least transient improvement uh, in people in certain electrophysiological measures, uh, EMG-based measures. So, you know, obviously we want to do everything we can to make people better, um, and at the very least to keep them from getting worse. Yeah, that's that's great, Robert. I, I, what I would say is that um, when we when we design a trial like this, we we design it. We we sort of have to say what's the minimum effect that we think we we need to be able to see. And, it's, and we design it from that minimum effect because it's harder to see a small effect than it is to see a big effect in a trial. So, so, so we have to think about what's the smallest, the smallest effect that we wanna be able to see and we'll be able to see anything that small or better. And so we, we never really, um, you know, when we're thinking about this and, and we say we're going to design the trial so that we can see a slowing of disease, that means that's the sort of minimum effect. If a drug were to, um, you know, in this case, CNMA08, if it were to improve function or arrest, uh, you know, completely arrest the disease, we would absolutely pick that up in the same design trial as one that's, that's looking for slowing of disease. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, we don't know uh, the effect of this drug in people yet. This is what the trial will, will teach us, but we do know that it has very strong um, preclinical science and rationale. So what kind of cohort are we looking to test? What, what are the required phenotypes of the patients? And I don't know, Robert, if you want to start first based on mechanism action, what, what, what your thoughts are, and then anyone else can add on to that. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we don't have any additional screening criteria, you know, for CNMA 8 except for gold allergy, which there is very, it doesn't really exist. True gold allergy doesn't actually exist. Or it's very, very rare. Um, so pretty much everyone, I don't think we've had a single screen fail uh, of patients that have, uh, that, have uh, that have screened successfully for the master protocol. I don't think we've had a single screen fail, you know, going into, in, into, into our protocol. So um, from our perspective, as Nicholas, I think uh, very elegantly uh, was talking about, we think that there probably are multiple mechanisms, mechanisms of action at play. And so we don't see any need to restrict uh, the population that we're testing. Now, of course, one that's, as you said, we don't really know how the drug works in human beings yet, <laughs> uh, and, or even if it works in human beings yet, although we're very hopeful. So we, we may know at the end of this study that there may be pa certain patients who respond much better to, to CNMA weight or patients that don't respond at all to CNMA weight. And that's something we can learn from the trial. There's a question, when is the soonest we could get results that would open this drug up for others? Um, we need uh, answers quick in AOS. Um, I can weigh in a little bit about the platform trial. So the um, uh, when we'll have results all depends on uh, when enrollment will be uh, complete. At the current rate of how enrollment is going at, at the centers, we think enrollment for the first three regimens, which include, which include um, the clean, uh, uh, investigational product be about April, May, and then um, there's six months for the last person enrolled to finish. So we're anticipating results for the first three regimens in the fall. That could go faster, obviously, if enrollment went faster. And I, I do say that so many people have been generous in being part of this. We are, we're over 300 people who have signed consent to be at the studies. We now have 40 sites open, uh, but I do think the pandemic has slowed things down a little bit, but it's still going very well. So I'm hoping we'll uh, have answers in the fall. Um, the platform trial, again, does speed things up because in the traditional way, we'd have answer to one of those drugs next fall, not all three. And then the fourth one is right behind. It'll be maybe eight weeks later, we'll have the results of, of the fourth drug. So um, it, will be, um, it will be just really an amazing time. I wish it could be even faster, um, but uh, it, it's, it's all tied to enrollment. So again, a huge thanks to many of you on the call and many other people who have already um, enrolled and, and, and many others who are reaching out to the centers. 
Could I just make a comment from a sponsor perspective? Yeah. You know, Merit, you and, and the group at MGH really need to be applauded. Um, what you've done is transformative. Um, and, you know, you guys built your own Oracle clinical database. You have your own biostats group. It's, it's really impressive work. And so, uh, I know I've been around drug development for a long time, but I'm an old man. And um, I have to say that um, working with you guys has been uh, really one of the highlights of my career. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I'll, I'll actually echo um, what Robert was saying. And, and that is that, you know, clinical trials for ALS you know, in 10 or 20 years ago were oftentimes a year long. And so I think it's, ex while frustrating that we can't get an answer, you know, tomorrow, the way this trial is designed to, to maximize the shortest possible time where we could see a signal to be confident that a drug works, uh, I think, is, I think has, um, is a result of a lot of creativity on, the, on um, you know, um, to that team. So I, I think that's helpful, hopefully, for patients. Thank you. Feel blessed to have a, a wonderful community that we all work together. To, to speed it up and go on the AOS clock, as, uh, as Sandy would say. So uh, this question is for Robert. Let, let's say all oh, actually is fantastic and it's a positive result next fall. How long would it take? Uh, how scalable is your manufacturing process? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's something that we're struggling with as a company. Um, so of course, you know, um, the way it works is uh, first the study has to complete as, as Merit said in the fall. Then of course the data have to be cleaned. That is the data have to be Q, you know, quality controlled. Then it has to go to the biostats group. They have to run their, their magic. And then we get the tables. Um, and then we find out if the drug works or not. And if it does, which I'm knocking on wood now, uh, we're very hopeful that it does. Uh, then um, the group at Massachusetts General Hospital, the, the data management group will send us all of the primary data, the, you know, the individual patient data, which then we have to incorporate into what's called an NDA submission or a new drug application submission which is a very tedious process, um, takes time. Um, when I was at Roche, it took six to nine months. Um, at Here at Clean, we expect you to do it in two to three months, but it's not easy. Um, we would, if, if we, we will likely apply for breakthrough status if our phase two study, which reads out for the Healy study is positive, we'll be applying for breakthrough status and that could speed up the, um, you know, the time it takes for FDA to review all the data and decide whether they're going to approve the drug um, it's possible we could, you know, if we get tables, let's say by the first quarter of 2022, we could potentially have an approval before the end of 2022. And I can tell you from a company's perspective, this is a huge challenge for us because building a manufacturing facility, getting it online and having, having it actually work, you know, within the next two years uh, is very, very difficult. Uh, I, I just can't stress how, how, how difficult it is. Uh, so that's our challenge. And the last thing we want is to be approved and not have enough drug. That's a nightmare. So we're doing everything we can. Um, in fact, we're cutting costs everywhere else in the company. But, um, like, you know, sort of getting ready to market the drug to explain to people how it actually works, which is not easy. All those things are being cut um, because we need to, you know, save money for manufacturing to build, to build the manufacturing facility. Um, so it, it's a challenge. We certainly want to be able to serve the needs of the entire community if indeed we're approved. Um, but I can tell you it's, um, it's something we struggle with every day. Thank you, uh, Robert. Um, there's, there's several people involved with Answer ALS on, the, on this line. So it's, this is a good question. Is CNM AUA involved with anything Answer ALS is doing? And if not, is it, would be, there's some ideas there. I don't know if Nick or James you wanna answer that one. Or maybe even just say what answer ALS is for maybe uh, yeah. The yeah so so uh, it's a it's a great question so answer ALS was is a project that involved a large number of people with ALS nearly a thousand people with ALS as well as people that didn't have ALS um, and we <clears throat> collected genomic information um, some people participated in a digital uh, digital monitoring piece of that um, we collected uh, blood and spinal fluid, which came to Mass General to be stored and shared. And we're beginning to use that for um, studies of molecules in, in the blood. Um, and we collected blood that went to Cedar sinai and was transformed into stem cells for research and then into motor neurons. And, and those motor neurons and stem cells are now being studied for what we call 
in a very jargony way, multi-omics. So this is um, proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics. So proteomics is the study of proteins. Uh, transcriptomics is the study of how, how genes are transcribed into RNA. And uh, metabolomics is the study of metabolites. This gives us a biological picture of those cells, those motor neurons from people with ALS and people who don't have ALS and can be an incredibly powerful tool for studying this disease, particularly because all of that is accompanied by very detailed clinical information that was obtained over the course of a year from people who participated in the study. So really rich resource, hypothesis generating, a place to test hypotheses. Um, much of what can be done with these, uh, with these some of the stem cells and the motor neurons mimics what Nicholas uh, Maragakis did and some of the data that, that was presented. So it gives us cell models. I think there probably are ways to use both the clinical data and uh, some of the IPS data and potentially blood biomarkers. Um, some of that may happen after, there's, uh, after we have results for, from this trial. I don't think there's any ongoing uh, collaboration, but that's the powerful thing about a, a study like Cancer ALS is that it creates a resource that lives on. I would just I would just add to that that um, you know the data we showed you, the cells that we used in fact uh, is uh, for the data you saw come from patients who participated in answer ALS and so these are really palpable. Uh, you know this is not something that although we think answer ALS and and everything that James just described will will live long into the future and will provide uh, tools for for investigators down the road. We're actually using these uh, currently. So you've already seen data that um, Robert just showed today with um, that represent um, uh, cells from patients who participated in answer ALS. Wonderful, Nicholas. Thank you. Um, so there are two quick questions that I answer. One, which is um, when we said, when I said that we'd have results hopefully in the fall, um, which year was I talking about? So I was talking about 2021. Sorry for not being clear on that. Um, and then the, how long the open label extension is. And our, our plans, and again, thank you to, to Clean for uh, providing it, that the open label extension will be up to 12 months. Uh, we hope obviously to have the results of the double blind part sooner, and then, uh, then the decisions on the open label would be guided by those results. Um, so there's a question about, um, and this is definitely for Robert, about how, uh, can you comment on how the nanocrystals are manufactured? Yeah, so it involves plasma physics, it involves a high amount of electricity, it involves very, very pure wa uh, uh, water, and very, very pure uh, gold wires, um, and I will say that. And um, the really amazing thing about these crystals is that they self-aggregate in water. That is, atom by atom, they self-aggregate into these preferred crystalline shapes, uh, and they remain stable in suspension in pharmaceutical-grade water for months to years. It's really an amazing feat that our founder, uh, Mark Mortensen, who's a physicist and material scientist, has uh, come up with. And, and uh, another question about the nanocrystals for you, Robert, is it says um, they, they increase the energy in the mitochondria. Is that in the axons? Um, and uh, does the metal like the gold get absorbed into the body or is it eliminated eventually? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, these crystals are absorbed into the body. Um, they go to preferred tissues, places like um, the kidney, liver, brain, um, eye, um, spinal cord, um, to a lesser extent, CSF. Um, and if you stop giving CNMA weight in animals, it goes away. I mean, it's excreted. It's mainly excreted uh, through the liver, through the bile, and through the feces. Um, so yeah, it, 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 you have to keep giving it, otherwise it goes away. Um, so I think that answered the question. Was there another part of that? Uh, no, I think that was good. That was good. Thank you. Uh, there's a question also about uh, the MS study. Which country is it in? And if it's helping with MS, with so many patients still being alive to lobby, do you think that that would help make this drug available? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we're in the same place in MS that we are in ALS. You know, we're in placebo controlled trials right now. We don't know if CNMA actually works. You know, we've seen very encouraging blinded data but it's blinded, we don't know. And we also know anybody that's done drug development uh, in neuroscience knows that placebo works. Uh, and so you have to be very cautious when you look at blinded data because you just don't know what you're seeing. 
we are seeing improvements in patients, uh, functional improvements in patients with uh, MS, but we don't know if that's, that could be due to several factors and not seen in any way, so we don't know. As far as where this study is being performed, right now it was originally performed only in Australia. We're in the process of adding six North American MS sites, but the, unfortunately the pandemic has thrown a wrench into MS research, much more so than ALS research because MS patients are generally immunocompromised or immunomodulated because of their disease modifying therapies. And so they're, you know, sites, academic sites and patients are much more reluctant to, you know, to go to sites and, and be in, a, in an environment where there may be COVID exposure. So I think, I mean, certainly for us, and I think it's probably true for all of the pharma companies, drug development in MS is essentially stopped. And it probably won't start again until 2022 for, for the most part. There's a couple of questions about um, survival. Um, and I don't know if Nick and James, you want to answer them. One is really about whether the, any, any of the preclinical data suggest um, what we might see in terms of survival and then uh, what do we expect in the trial? Nick, you want to start with the preclinical question? Um, I would say that preclinically, um, with respect to ALS, it's primarily been the in vitro data that you saw in a dish data. And then uh, a small, but I think important um, uh, drug delivery strategy in, in these ALS mice. And so um, I would say, you know, I think it's encouraging for the points I was making before is that I, it gives us confidence in thinking about how it will translate. But I think what we've learned over the years is trying to compare what we might see in a mouse or let's say a survival effect in a mouse is just simply um, uh, doesn't predict a survival benefit or a degree of survival benefit in, in patients. And that's, I think that simply reflects because, you know, these mice are highly um, uh, inbred and are very similar. And we as patients, we as humans are all very, very different. And so um, it gives us confidence to take it forward, but I, I, I would hesitate to make a, a comparison with the degree of improvement in the mice or survival benefit in the mice and what we might expect to see in patients. Um, and and so so there's uncertainty. I mean, I think um, if, if we see slowing of disease based on the ALS functional rating scale, there's a high correlation between, between the, the, the ALS functional rating scale slope and, and survival. So you know, we can be hopeful that if we see a, um, a benefit as far as slowing progression by ALS FRSR, that we could also see a benefit in, in survival. Um, and it's always hard with a sophisticated audience to, to, um, to simplify. And I, I sort of yada yada an important point earlier when, when, when uh, I answered a question about, about the outcomes and statistics. And I said that we're, you know, we're looking for a slowing of decline of ALS FRSR, but the statistics are a little more complicated. And one of the things I didn't explain then, but will now is that the primary endpoint for this, uh, for this trial uh, is primarily focused on ALS FRSR slowing but it also does account for survival. And if there was a survival benefit, it would be factored into that outcome measure as well. And so we, we are on the lookout for that. We also will analyze uh, survival separately, um, but we're on the lookout for that as an outcome measure here. And we would pick that up. Great, thank you. Um, there's uh, two quick questions that I wanna leave time for everyone to have last comments. One is, uh, what would we do if AMOX became available? Um, and I'll, I'll say a general thing, if any drug becomes available, meaning FDA approved for ALS, we would allow that in the platform trial. So would any other trial. It might mean some changes to the protocol, in particular, increasing the number of people in, that we would need in each of the arms, um, but that would be the plan for any drug that, that came to market. Um, and the other one was uh, if we have any results from our expanded access. And um, the, the short answer is no, we don't yet. Um, uh, it is kind of hard sometimes in expanded access because again, you don't have a comparison group. And uh, the nice thing about expanded access is there's no restrictions. So we have people in all stages of the illness, um, including people who've had it 10 or 12 years. And, and so it, it's very hard to make a lot of statements about efficacy. It's really a compassionate use uh, study. Though you can say things about safety and biomarkers and other things like that. Um, so maybe just uh, if, if there's any closing comments, that, um, maybe you first, Robert, and then, then Nick and James. 
Well, you know, we're just we're just very very um, uh, honored and, and uh, grateful to be a part of the Helios platform trial, and um, you know, we look forward to continued partnership. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would just say that you know we're all excited about the platform trial. I think this regimen is built on good science, um, and you know we're we're positioned to to pick up uh, an effect, and we we hope we'll see a beneficial effect. That's why we're doing the trial. We're really looking forward to um, continuing on and getting some answers. Patients oftentimes ask if if we like one drug over another, and I think what I would say is you know at least here at Hopkins we 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 won't study a drug that we don't think is um, has a scientific basis or a good scientific basis. And so um, I think the platform trial and, you know, certainly this drug represents a nice relationship between um, basic science investigations and seeing that come to fruition translationally in, in, in clinical research. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. We will um, post the recording for uh, any, any of your friends or anybody else, but we appreciate you coming and hopefully we'll see many of you back next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.